Now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Carly O'Brien. Carly has a background in Chinese medicine, public health, and previously optometry. She is now one of the leading educators in medicinal cannabis in Australia. Her first book, A Clinician's Guide to Integrative Oncology, was co-authored with Professor Sally, and she is currently writing a new book focused on medicinal cannabis and mental health with Dr. Blair. Carly, over to you. Okay, so who, um, who's used cannabis before medicinally? Who's interested in using cannabis? Okay, great. All right, so I'm talking about medicinal cannabis this evening, not recreational use. Um, and I'm going to define that as cannabis or cannabis products used specifically to treat illness, ideally prescribed by a qualified healthcare practitioner, and of course, like most herbs, individualised to the patient. Now, it's got a very interesting history. This plant has been used medicinally probably for at least 12,000 years that we know about. It's, um, the oldest written record is in one of the Chinese texts, the Shen Nong Ben Chao Jing. And it was used to treat constipation, female reproductive tract problems, malaria and constipation. They even used it as an anaesthetic when they mixed it with wine. I probably prefer the anaesthetics of today, but maybe that was all they had then. Now, if we look in different cultures, it was used in ancient India, it still is, in a drink, and it's called bung, and they use that for anxiety. It's even mentioned in the Old Testament. And on the picture on the right-hand side, that's from um, a, an Egyptian papyrus from about 3,000 years ago, and it's an asthma remedy, where they mixed herbs, they heated it on a brick, and then the person inhaled the fumes. Now, in Europe, several hundred years ago, when um, I guess Europe uh, dominated the, the seas, they actually used the fibre from the plant um, for its sails and ropes. So um, it, was, it was in common use in Europe. And even uh, back in 1533, King Henry VIII ordered the English farmers to grow hemp or they risk paying a stiff fine. Now, in the 1700s, war with with Britain was approaching, and I didn't know much about the Boston Tea um, Party, but it was a protest uh, at the Boston Wharf where the American, I guess, wharf um, operators threw uh, British tea into the drink. But the uh, Americans um, were already starting to assert their independence. There was a, a, a tension between the colonies and Britain. So they started to refuse to send the raw hemp fibre back to Britain, and they started to process it themselves. Now, even the um, Declaration of Independence was penned on hemp paper. So by the mid-1800s, hemp was the third largest crop, cotton was the first one, and tobacco. Now, George Washington grew hemp in 1762. Virginia awarded bounties for hemp culture and manufacture, and they imposed, again, penalties on those who didn't produce it. So... There's a bit of conjecture in the literature whether George Washington was sowing hemp just for the fibre or whether he might have been using it medicinally as well. But that's a couple of his diary entries. And the reason I think that is when they, he's talking about beginning to separate the male from the female hemp rather too late, to, um, to produce cannabis medicinally, you need to keep the, flower, the, the female plants separate from the males. You want the unfertilised um, flowers. So that's why they think... Maybe he might have been using it medicinally as well. Who knows? Now, in the American Civil War in 1861, the hemp fibre um, was starting to decline in its commercial value because it was getting overtaken by cotton and also Jim and the, and the steamship was powering along. But then they started to increase in terms of its value as a medicine. So it was actually quite common in the US. It was used in particular for pain. So um, a company called Grimalt & Sons also marketed it as cigarettes as an asthma remedy. So it was a staple in a, in a lot of things used for pain relief in plasters and poultices and ointments. Now in 1860, the Ohio, Ohio State Medical Society was the first one to actually get a government grant to study it. And Sir William Osler endorsed cannabis as the best treatment for migraine headaches as well as its... Um, the pain and the nausea and vomiting associated with it. 
Whilst over in the UK, Sir John Russell Reynolds, who was the uh, Queen Victoria's personal physician, he used it to treat uh, the Queen's menstrual cramps. And he also uh, endorsed it for the use of insomnia as well. Now, I didn't realise in the 1920s in the US, alcohol was a banned substance for about 14 years. And then it became unbanned around 1934. America was heading into the Great Depression and the Federal Bureau of Narcotics was facing a downturn, whether they could actually substantiate such a large staff. Harry Jane, uh, J. Anslinger was the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics at the time. And he turned his attention to something else he could, I guess, ban, and that was cannabis, under the name of marijuana. So, basically, a smear campaign started on medicinal cannabis. It was also a way of, I guess, stopping Mexicans coming into the country with their marijuana. And if you look at the, um, I guess, the demographics of who got thrown into jail after the um, prohibition started, it was a lot of black people. The AMA, the Australian Medical Association, challenged um, the claim that cannabis was a dangerous drug at the time because on the US pharmacopoeia, there were over 100 indications for the use of medicinal cannabis. Doctors were using it very commonly. But the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937 got passed and as a result, um, it basically uh, prohibited the use of cannabis. Now, at the moment, Worldwide, United Nations uh, single convention on narcotic drugs, cannabis is a Schedule One drug, which means its international trade and uh, production is restricted. In the US federally, under their Controlled Substances Act, it's an S1 drug. So that's a substance with high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use in treatment, which is kind of strange, isn't it, given that over 100 indications of medicinal cannabis before it was prohibited. Now, the World Health Organization Expert Committee did a, um, a review on cannabis and some of the main active constituents in the cannabis plant. And they recommended in 2018 that um, the recommendation will go to the UN next month, that one of the main active constituents, cannabidiol, which we'll talk about in a moment, should be removed from Schedule 1 of this United Nations Single Convention. So that's just a little bit about the history. So what is cannabis? How many strains of cannabis do you think there are? Give me, give me an, an idea. 5,000. 5,000, 50? OK. There are hundreds of strains. So firstly, it's a plant. Um, it's one species and two subspecies, sativa and indica. There's a little bit of, I guess, argument within the literature about taxonomy or how you name things, but we'll go with this definition at the moment, which is the World Health Organization's definition. Now, how is it used? Well, medicinally, predominantly oil from the, the flowers and the leaves, but also the seeds are used too. In industry, hemp is just cannabis with a low amount of the main intoxicating ingredient, tetrahydrocannabinol. It's still cannabis. And we use that, we use the oil from the seeds in food, so you can go to the supermarket and buy hemp hearts or hemp oil. It's used in the cosmeceutical industries. You can get hemp hair shampoo and, and lots of other things, skincare, etc., as well as used for livestock feed. The fibre from the stalk and the leaves is used in the textile industry, in paper, as a substitute for plastic. Building, so you can have bricks made out of it, that's the top picture there. And if you look under the bonnet of a Mercedes Benz, apparently some of the bits under there are made from hemp as well. So that was something I learnt in Borneo a couple of years ago. So as I said, hemp is cannabis, those varieties with low tetrahydrocannabinol. And we'll talk about that in the moment, but that's the the active constituent, one of many, but it's the only one that will give you that intoxicating effect in sufficient doses. So in Europe, the upper legal limit for cultivating hemp for fibre and seeds is 0.2% THC. In the US, it's 0.3%. So again, what's the difference between medicinal cannabis oils and hemp seed oils? Well, um, if you look at the pictures there, 
The oils that we use medicinally are produced on, I guess, little um, resin glands at the top called trichomes on the flowers. They're little, little factories that produce the active constituents, the phytocannabinoids, the terpenes, which are the essential oils that give the plant the smell. So it can be used medicinally as an oil in a capsule or tincture. It can be used raw, so you can smoke it or vape it in a, in a vaping pen. The hemp seed oil is from the seeds and it doesn't contain the cannabinoids, so you're not going to be able to get high by eating a handful of hemp seed, um, hemp seeds or hemp hearts. So it's produced for its nutraceutical and its cosmeceutical value. Now, medicinal cannabis is not one thing. It's got over 500 chemical constituents in it. It's got 120 cannabinoids, and they've all got therapeutic actions, 11 classes of them. It's got terpenes or terpenoids, and they've got their own therapeutic actions as well. So um, they give you the characteristic smell. So if something's got a lot of alpha pinene in it, it's going to smell a bit like pine needles. If it's got limonene, it's going to smell a bit lemonish. So when you smell the different um, strains of cannabis, they can smell slightly different, um, you know, different. And I guess the more you, you get used to being able to differentiate, you know, the more you can tell between the different strains. If I smelled one and then the other, maybe I couldn't tell a lot of difference. Uh, maybe I can. And it's got lots of other plant nutrients in it as well. So as I said, the female flower, made up of smaller little florets over on the left side, the trichomes are the factories that produce the active constituents. And they're mostly on the flowers and also on the leaves and the bracts and the stems. The two most well researched of the phytocannabinoids, the two active or two of the active constituents, are tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, and cannabidiol. And we're going to be talking mostly about those two tonight. Only THC has got potentially intoxicating properties. And the reason I say potentially is it's, it's dose dependent. So if you prescribe something with THC in it with a low dose and you only took a small amount of it, you're probably not going to get any great effect in terms of a euphoric high. In the recreational market, the strains are bred to have high amounts of THC because people want to get the euphoric effect. And, as I said, um, the plants actually contained the acid forms of the cannabinoids. So if you took the plant or the flower, it has the acid forms and they're not intoxicating. It's only when you um, age it or heat it um, or exposure to light where you lose CO2, it's called decarboxylation, and then you get the non-acid form, THC. That is the one that has potentially intoxicating properties. So that's the difference between the raw plant just taken out of a pot plant. Now, who knows why? Have you got any idea why cannabis might work for humans? Do you realise we make our own cannabinoids in our body? Who knew that? A few people. Oh, you're well informed. Okay, so we've got humans and animals have got our own cannabinoid system, endo within cannabinoids. And this endocannabinoid system is in nearly every part of our body. It's critical in the homeostasis of nearly all our organ systems. So homeostasis is what it does. It modulates all these different things, our immune system, our energy and metabolism, the development of the embryo, the development of our brain as we grow from um, a fetus through to adulthood. It regulates inflammation and pain, our emotions, and many others. Three main components, we have endocannabinoids. One is called anandamide. Ananda means bliss in Hindi. The other one is 2-AG, and there are several others. We've got receptors, basically CB, cannabinoid receptor 1, cannabinoid receptor 2, CB1 and CB2, and others. And then we've got the proteins that are involved with synthesising them, transporting them and breaking them back down when they're used. So this picture here just gives you a little bit of an idea of how extensive these CB1 and CB2 receptors are in our body. Now the CB1 receptors are mostly, in particular in our brain, but also in the other organ systems of our body. 
and the CB2 receptors are in particular in our immune system, in our immune cells and organs. Here's just a picture of the brain and um, the areas where the CB1 receptor. And a lot of these areas relate to how we process stress and emotions. I won't give you a big lesson on how they work, but essentially they're called retrograde messengers. They are produced on demand. So we have a low level of endocannabinoids, and andamide and the others, um, under normal conditions. But they get synthesised fairly quickly in response to different stimuli. So that could be a viral infection, it could be stress, it could be exercise, it could be inflammation. And what they do is that they diffuse across what they call the synaptic cleft, they go back to the other sending neuron and they modulate the release of other neurotransmitters in the body. So that's essentially how it works. Once they've done their job, they've modulated these other neurotransmitters, they get degraded very quickly and removed from the system. Now, a deficiency or a dysfunction in some way of our endocannabinoid system is implicated in many conditions of the body. And here's just a few of them where they think that a deficiency in some way may be implicated. So how do our phyto or plant cannabinoids work? Well, essentially, they're going to interact with the same receptors we've already got in our system. THC is what they call a partial agonist at both the CB1 and CB2 receptors. In other words, it links in with it and affects change that way. The cannabidiol is a little bit different. It doesn't really um, link in with the same affinity to those CB1 and CB2 receptors. We think its actions as a neuroprotective agent, an antioxidant, a pain relieving agent, an anti-anxiety agent is probably acting through other transmitters in our body, other receptors. So here are some of the actions of the phytocannabinoids. Pain relieving, antioxidant, nerve protecting, antipsychotic, anxiolytic, so reducing anxiety, anti-emetic, anti-vomiting, helps induce sleep, anti-diabetic, works in skin conditions, for psoriasis, many other, um, many other actions. Now that slide just shows you cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol, the two well-researched, I guess, active constituents. And they've got some, quite a bit of crossover there, haven't they? They're both anti-inflammatory, they both work on pain, both have an anxiolytic actions in some ways, etc. Now, we're not just talking about two things or two active constituents out of a plant. Plants are complex, and this is the difference between looking at a whole plant and a drug. The drug, the pharmaceutical industry likes to take a plant, extract an active constituent, copy it, bung something else on the end and then call it a new drug and then patent it. It's very hard to patent a plant. The terpenes, the essential oils that give it its smell, have got their own therapeutic action on the body. So that slide up there just gives you some of them. D-limonene, smells a bit lemonish, helps in anxiety, helps, may treat uh, gastroesophageal reflux. Alpha-pinene, the one that, and Terpenes are also present in other plants. These are not um, just in the cannabis plant. So obviously pine needles are going to have alpha pine in, in them as well. So when we think about medicinal cannabis, we want to know, is this a whole plant extract or is it just an isolate of one active constituent? Because they're probably going to act differently. So if we look at what uh, conditions that medicinal cannabis might be used to treat, here's just some of them. Pain, chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, and spasticity associated with MS. There was a report written by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in 2017. They used evidence from randomised controlled trials and systematic reviews. Now, a systematic review is simply taking a whole lot of randomised controlled trials, putting them in together, pooling the data, and coming up with a yes-no answer, basically. Is this efficacious for this condition? and they found substantial or conclusive evidence that medicinal cannabis or cannabinoids 
were effective in chronic pain, chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, and spasticity associated with MS, and a moderate amount of evidence for sleep disorders. Now, that's only a small amount of evidence because there are many other forms of evidence too. And since that report um, was put out in 2017, there have been a lot of other studies. And so these are just some of the conditions, and Philip will probably talk about some more of those. Cannabidiol is interesting. It does not get you high. It cannot get you high. But it's anti-inflammatory with a whole range of other actions as well. It's used in particular to treat epilepsy. But, um, you know, in terms of looking in the, into the literature, here's a whole lot of other conditions that cannabidiol can be used um, to treat. And there's many more than this. I've just picked out a few here. But autism, um, anxiety, diabetes, inflammation, anything that's underpinned by inflammation probably, certain neurodegenerative diseases, anxiety. I've just put that one up there because I have a particular interest in, in cancer um, as, a, as a clinician as, and as well as a researcher. So it uh, has been found that medicinal cannabis can act on the various different um, cancer pathways. That includes reducing inflammation because cancer is a condition that's underpinned by inflammation. Um, it can help inhibit invasion, metastases, which is the spread of cancer to other parts of the body from a primary tumour. And in animal studies, um, it's been shown to reduce tumour growth. For example, glioblastoma is a, a brain condition, breast, prostate and colon, can colon cancer. So these are animal studies. And of course, it can be used to help with the symptoms and signs associated with cancer, which can be the pain, the chemo induced noise and vomiting, anxiety and depression, which are, are often there, sleep disorders and anorexia. In 2016, just as Australia was starting to legalise medicinal cannabis, a colleague of mine, Nick Lynn Sirius, and his team at University of Sydney conducted a survey of people who had been using um, cannabis medicinally themselves for about nine, I think it was almost 10 years. This is almost 1,800 Australians. And they asked them, well, what do you use them for? And the top reasons were anxiety, back pain, depression then sleep and neck pain and post-traumatic stress disorder. And more than 80 people who responded to the survey said that the medicinal cannabis effectively managed their target symptoms. In the US, the Washington State Survey again found similar sort of reported conditions for which cannabis was used. Pain, anxiety, depression, migraine, nausea, muscle spasticity. And again, on average, 86% reduction in symptoms, nearly 60% used the cannabis as a, uh, an alternative to pharmaceuticals. Now, cannabis products aren't just one thing either. So, you can have raw herbs, which is the flowers and leaves. They call them buds. You can smoke them. You can put them in a, a, a vaping device. And you've got proprietary forms, that's things in bottles. And they can be phytocannabinoid botanicals, so basically, usually whole plant extracts. And they can be in capsules, or pills, they can be a sublingual spray that you spray under your tongue. They can be suppositories, um, they can be patches, they can be topical ointments or just the oils that you put on your tongue. Then you've got cannabis-based liquid extracts. Nabiximols is um, basically THC and CBD together. So that's a registered drug. And then you've got um, single molecule drugs. So these are synthetic prescription drug, drugs like nabilone and trinabinol, and these are um, FDA approved in the US. So there's just, I guess, a few different um, pictures. That thing on the right is one of the forms of a, a vaping device. There's many of them. They can just look like a little pen. And you press a button and that heats the, the oil up and you take a drag on the, the, um, the vaping pen. I guess the difference between smoking and vaping compared to taking it as an oil or a capsule is that it gets into your system very quickly because you inhale it into your lungs and it goes fairly quickly into your bloodstream from there. Whereas if you take it as an oil or a capsule, it's got to go into your stomach and it has to go through what they call the liver, the first pass mechanism. So it takes longer to get into your system, but it probably lasts longer as well. So sometimes for acute conditions where there's acute pain or something like that where you need to get it fixed quickly, 
then probably the vaping is a quicker way to act than obviously waiting for it to work for a few hours before it gets through your stomach. So that's why there are different ways of taking uh, cannabis. So as I said, oils ain't oils. There are many different strains or cultivars, and they've got really weird names like OG Kush and Skywalker and things like that. Um, you won't see those on labels and bottles in Australia, though. That's mostly um, in the uh, dispensaries in the US. So, um, as I said, medicinal cannabis products contain different ratios of these key phytocannabinoids. So you'll often see what's called a balanced um, product, which means CBD and THC are about one to one. Then you can have a high THC and a low CBD, or the other way around, and then variations in between. Some of them will just be the isolate, and others will be a whole plant where you've got the phyto, other phytonutrients and the terpenes in there, adding what they call the entourage effect. So it's like those other constituents are adding to the therapeutic value of the main cannabinoids in the medicine. So you can tell I'm a herbalist because I actually think that the whole plants are probably, um, personally, what I would be taking. Now, um, safety. Okay, so the World Health Organization report says cannabidiol is generally well tolerated, good safety pro uh, profile. Um, no uh, public health related problems associated with it. Um, it doesn't show any signs of being able to be abused or you, you can't become dependent on it, in other words. Now, it can interact with some drugs that are metabolised by the same enzyme. That's why it's important to have it prescribed by a healthcare practitioner who can just check those interactions and make sure that that's not going to be a problem, or at least if, if they might interact, potentially monitor and make sure that there's no problems. THC, well, it's the same as cannabis. It can give you laughter, euphoria, increased appetite. None of those probably are bad things inherently. A dry mouth occasional dizziness, and again, this is dose dependent. So a lot of this is, as I said, higher doses could start to give you the effects of, like you would, smoking a joint. In some cases, there could be nausea and vomiting, subtle cognitive defects, um, but these are, tend to be sort of modest in magnitude and reversible when you stop smoking it. The World Health Organization also says that randomised controlled trials in which THC is sometimes given daily for periods of years generally report low to moderate toxicity and a low incidence of serious adverse effects. So in other words, it's, it's pretty safe. In terms of access, this is changing very rapidly around the world at the moment. In the US, 33 states allow the legal access to medicinal cannabis and probably 10 or 11 now, and I'm going to check with James later, but um, states will allow adult use or recreational use. That's despite the fact that in the US, federally, it's a Schedule One drug. In Canada, they've passed laws allowing access to recreational use. In the ACT, we now have um, adult use available as well. In Australia, um, I think things are still relatively difficult and there's a number of reasons for that. Now, we know that probably over 2 million Australians use it recreationally. Anywhere between 100 and 200,000 Australians are using grey or black market medicinal cannabis. They're sourcing it themselves for their own um, medical problems. Now, it's possible in Australia since 2016 it was um, legally available in Australia. However, um, CBD, cannabidiol, is a Schedule IV drug, which means prescription only. And anything with um, a reasonable amount of THC is a Schedule VIII drug, which is a controlled substance. So that means only doctors are able to prescribe it and they have to go through a special access scheme or become an authorised prescriber to do so, which is a lot of paperwork, basically. Um, and that's because in Australia, under the Therapeutic Goods Administration, medicinal cannabis is still considered an unapproved medicine. Now, my argument now is that was back in 2016. We're now in 2020. When are you going to approve it? Our driving laws make it an offence to have any amount of THC in the body so if you get pulled over and you, you, they do a drug test on you um, and you've got THC, then you're guilty um, of um, going against our driving laws. So that's a problem. And I actually had um, 
I had lunch with Scott Morrison last year, lucky me. And um, a friend of mine had a seat at his table and said, you go in my place and talk to him about cannabis. So I had two minutes to get something across. And I said, um, you know, we've got a problem with our driving laws. If you get pulled over, you're, you're done for drug driving. He said, can't you just hand over your prescription? And I said, that would be logical, but no, not in this country. So we've still got a problem. And that's off-putting for patients and probably doctors as well. Um, in that, you know, they get worried. And same with workplace safety as well. Some workplace will test you. And as I said, in Canada, they've got around this quite nicely by saying you have to be impaired before you get a fine. Uh, so it's impairment. It's not just the, the amount of, uh, just the presence of THC. It has to be, you have to be impaired. That would be a more sensible um, law for our country. So for me, I think Access is a human rights issue. It's difficult. A lot of doctors don't prescribe it because they don't know about it. Um, it's not familiar to them. There's a stigma sometimes that they're worried about. So we have a bottleneck, in other words. Um, it's difficult. And I see access as a human rights issue. So it impacts on us as a public. One in five Australians alone could benefit from medicinal cannabis for chronic pain. And if you look at it from an industry perspective, jobs, et cetera, for the industry, it's impacting um, dreadfully on that as well. So it comes back to education. I'm glad you're all here tonight because that's the purpose of this, education. And I like to end with this slide because uh, the usual thing is talk to kids about marijuana thinking it's, you know, something to put them off. Many studies, even from our government, find that pot is virtually harmless. In fact, cannabis is one of the most beneficial plants etc. So um, I never thought my career as a Chinese medico would be hijacked by a plant like this. Um, it's, I've got Professor Ian Brighthope to blame for that. Um, he asked me to come into this um, and look at this as a serious um, need for education a couple of years ago. And I'd have to say that um, I have never been captivated by any plant, and not for the funny reasons, um, as, as cannabis. I can see its tremendous benefit and it makes sense because we have a system in our body already ready made for it. So in conclusion, it's a plant. All mammals have got an endocannabinoid system. We think many diseases are probably associated with a dysfunction of the endocannabinoid system in some way and the research bears that out. There are active constituents of cannabis and they can interact with our cannabinoid receptors. There are hundreds of different strains, and there is a growing evidence base. So if anyone says there's no evidence for that, send them my way. Um, it's been demonised historically, and it continues to be demonised. So I think you've done the right thing. You're educating yourself about it. Um, if you're interested um, to learn more, I would consult a doctor who is trained in um, medicinal cannabis, and there's a number of them here at NIM as well. And again, access is a human rights issue. So if you feel strongly enough that I'd encourage you to start to talk to your local politician and help get things changed in this country. Thank you very much.